I've decided to remain in the Old Testament with uh, your permission to be able to look at an Old Testament passage, in fact one of the, f the first mention of the Spirit in the Bible, and uh, look at that through New Testament eyes. And I had four or five points ready for today, but I'm only going to do the first one because there's so much in it. And uh, whenever you come to maybe familiar passages of Scripture with fresh eyes asking God to speak to you, it's amazing at what, what you find. The Bible really is the inspired Word of God. We're going to have a look at Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. This is the first mention of the Holy Spirit, and how wonderful to see Him already present and active on the earth. Because this is my definition of the Spirit, God in action. God is the living God. He is the God of action. He is the God that intervene, who intervenes. He is the God who draws close. He is the God who is always nearby to fulfill His purpose and His design in our lives. If we look at this passage on its own, we learn a lot about the Holy Spirit. Of course, the Old Testament develops these themes, but we don't really meet the Holy Spirit in His full personality as the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, personal Spirit of God, until the New Testament times. But there's so much here that lays a great foundation. Let's have a look at it. A very difficult passage to begin to think about, because it starts in the beginning. Now none of us can project our minds or imaginations to that point beyond the beginning. But there's something so important to realize that this universe had a beginning. And nobody's doubting that these days ever since the Big Bang Theory when science finally caught up with the Bible and said yes the universe did have a beginning. But up until that point they said no the universe always existed. But now the scientists have a problem, ladies and gentlemen, because they've got to explain how does the universe come from nothing. And for us as Bible-believing Christians, the revelation is very, very clear. It was God who created the world out of nothing. And because He is not part of the creation, the question is where does He come from doesn't even arise, because He is not part of this created world. But everything that we see is created had a beginning. And it must have come from nothing, because the universe hasn't always existed. It came into being. That's what the Big Bang Theory says. But we have some wonderful, ingenious physicists today who are very, very happy about quantum physics. And let me quote a couple of them, and I move quickly on. I know there's some scientists who enjoy this kind of stuff, and the rest of us, ballet dancers and artists, can just pretend for a moment. <laughs> Stephen Hawking, in his book, The Grand Design, says, because the law of gravity exists, the universe can and will create itself out of nothing. Oh, no, no God, just happens. And then another wonderful intelligent man, Lawrence Krauss, his book is entitled, The Universe Out of Nothing. But when you look carefully what they mean by nothing, they don't mean nothing. They mean that there was a rather rich pulsating field subject to physical laws resulting in quantum fluctuations. Don't ask me what it means, I'm just reading it out. <laughs> they say it all began with a quantum energy field which doesn't sound like nothing to me. So they haven't solved the problem. But for us as Bible-believing Christians, it is not a problem to solve but amazing revelation that God pre-existed the creation of this world from all eternity with all His glory, all His fullness. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in great glory and in relational perfection and unity and total self-sufficiency, not needing anything, but chose at a certain point in time to glorify Himself by creating the world. And therefore we read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now. We move quickly on and sometimes miss a slight tension here. 
I want to build a bit of attention because a bit of tension, not attention. Please give me your attention. I'll give you tension in return. Build some tension because you would expect God created the heavens and the earth. The next verse to say it was wonderful. It was so full of shape and life and beauty. But no, 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 no. The next verse, part of the verse goes on to say, the earth was without form, void, and darkness was over the, over the earth. Hmm. Scary words. Without form, shapeless. Without content, empty. Without light, just darkness. What is God doing here? First of all, I want you to understand this from the point of view of an artistic image. Now, I'm very entitled to do this because we are talking about the greatest creative process ever. God is the original and greatest artist. All right. So, imagine an artist with a blank canvas or a sculptor with a piece of clay. The first thing an artist does is prepare the canvas, get all the working materials together, and then begin out of that, what? To form his work of art, to fill it with detail and content. So the result is there is an enlightening revelation of what is in the heart and mind of the artist. God is simply preparing his canvas here. So that's the artistic point. But there is a very relevant set of theological points. And we realize, we learn so much about God from this opening verse of the Bible. Not only is he all powerful and, and so forth, but he is a God of process. It's very important that we appreciate that because even in our lives today, God very rarely does everything all at once. That's how we'd like him to work, just the way I did that. We'd say, God, I, this is what I need. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. But God is a God of process. He is a God of order. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And anyway, in showing us this process of creation and the unfolding work of creation, we learn about God's regularities, attention to detail. So he is working according to a plan, following a process, and establishing that he is a God who is always at work, always moving, always developing his creation and developing his purposes in the world. He is patient, deliberate. I'm so glad that God is like that because that's how he's dealing with me. I am not the finished product. Excuse me, I know you are shocked to hear that. <laughs> but I'm not the No, neither are you. None of us is the finished product. And have you ever wondered why God does it like this? Because everything's in its order. In the new creation, God recreates us. We're born again, receive the life of God by the Holy Spirit. And that is an instantaneous gift. But then the outworking of the process of the Bible called sanctification, growing to be like Jesus, being shaped to be into the image of Jesus, our life being filled with the content of the kingdom of God as we begin to see every revelatory aspect of the kingdom develop and unfold in, in our lives. And I even think we'll be surprised when we get to heaven, even in heaven, there'll be the opportunity to continue to grow in understanding and the a marvel and worship at the grace and goodness of God and it's going to take some time and he's given us all eternity to do it. No, no, no. God is a God of process. And sometimes when you ask God for certain things in your life and you think, Holy Spirit, you're supposed to be hovering over my life. Why is it that this is taking time? How is it you don't show me everything at once? How is it that you lead me step by step in the process of your unfolding wisdom and grace and goodness in my life? And God says, well, that's just who I am. I have a plan. I'm working towards a purpose. And I want you to understand every step of the way that I love you and have not abandoned you. 
So here we have God creating everything. Notice from the very beginning, the, the Trinity is there. God the Father, he's the one who speaks. The word that is spoken is the Son of God himself. And the action that results is the Spirit of God, God in action. And that's exactly what's happening. But the little snapshot we have is of this preparatory work, which is the beginning of the process, of a wonderful process of, of, of creation. And there's the picture of the Holy Spirit hovering over God's creation. Now, there are two ways of seeing this image. You can, James says, hovering. And, and I, I kind of see that like the, the bird that you see, the kestrel, the bird that you see hovering on the wind, waiting, and then <laughs> diving into action. What's the Spirit waiting for? The Spirit's waiting for the Word. As soon as God says, let there be, the Holy Spirit moves into action. This brings together again a point we make virtually every Sunday, cannot resist to make it again today, that God's Word and God's Spirit work together. This Pentecost Sunday, remember that we are as much excited about the Word of God as we are about the Spirit of God, and we don't want to be Word people only or Spirit people only. God's purpose is to bring those two together, the Word and the Spirit. But when we see this in another perspective, um, the, the, the word here is in the feminine, referring perhaps to a bird brooding, brooding over its nest of eggs, incubating, brooding God's purposes. I, I, I love that. I love that idea. I love the idea that the Holy Spirit is brooding over my life to bring to birth spiritual reality, taking care of God's purposes, nurturing God's purposes, and bringing me to the point of fullness so that as long as I am sensitive to the Holy Spirit and obedient to the Word of God, then God's purposes shall be fulfilled in my life. For he who has begun a good work in you shall carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It also shows me that as that early form of creation, as it was beginning to unfold, was so totally dependent on the outside influence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but particularly the Holy Spirit, God in action to bring it about, as that creation was and is so dependent on God, you and I are totally dependent on God. For without the Holy Spirit, without God's intervention in our lives, we would forever be without form. We would forever we'd be empty. Forever we'd be walking in darkness. So we totally depend on the Holy Spirit. If there's any one thing I want you to take from this message, is for you to go home saying to yourself, my, 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 I am totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. Without him, I could do nothing. Amen, amen and amen. amen. Okay, now let me just take you through, before we come to, to pray with you and pray for you, let me take you through, through those three words which in their original context can sound a bit, a bit alarming. First of all, the earth was without form. In other words, it was shapeless. And um, as a result of the Holy Spirit, the shape begins to take place. Then it goes on to say that it was void, empty, meaning that God is going to fill it with every aspect of his creation. And the final visual image is that of light. Now, in their first context, we don't take this in any way that is negative. It's not saying that God created something in the beginning and it was bad. No, no, no. He, it just wasn't complete. But I am convinced that these words are recorded to remind us, to give us hope, because after sin entered the world, those words not only described us, they describe us in the sense of the full negativity of what it means to live a life without God. Without God, your life has no shape. 
It has no purpose. And indeed, the very reason for your being, which is to be shaped into the image of Jesus Christ, to be f- for Christ to be formed in you, that purpose hasn't even begun until you surrender your life to the Holy Spirit. And the second thing, your life is totally empty without God. In other words, it's as if God says, yes, I have made you, but, but you need to know I've made you for a purpose and I can think of no higher purpose. And it, it means so much more than what we've time to say today, but that your life should be filled with the living presence of God, the Holy Spirit in total communion with the living God. That's why we were made. That's why we were created. And then the revelation that we need. We walk in darkness if we walk without God. So I believe that these words are something that will come back to our memory when we read later on in Genesis of sin entering the world and the fall and know that God has not abandoned us. If God can move upon the surface of the waters, if God can move over the creation to bring shape into the formlessness of the existence of the world at that point, to bring fullness where there was emptiness and light where there was darkness and is not abandon us in the first creation, then in the new creation, God is going to come and do those very things. How wonderful to know that he shapes your life. And he's doing so right now. And this tells me that once your life is, is being shaped by God, nothing else can shape it. Uh, one of the tragedies today is this. I think it's something we have to stand strong against. I don't know how successful we are in KT of doing this. We must make sure we are successful. And that is to refuse the pressure of being shaped by the influences of this world. Now, responding to those influences and speaking to those influences is important. Jesus said, if the salt loses its flavor, it's of no value anymore. And the only way to make sure that you are being influenced by God and not influenced by the world around you with your ideas, your thinking, and your values being shaped by the world, pressing to its own mold, is to be shaped by the Holy Spirit. It's to, it's to put yourself like a lump of clay on the altar of God's artistry. You see, after the science, I'm sticking to art, okay. And to say, here I am, I I present my body as a living sacrifice. I refuse to let the world's ideas and values shape me. I want to be shaped by the Holy Spirit so that I can then go and shape others according to that same revelation. That's why it's so important for you to be in discipleship relationship with your brothers and sisters. We stress every Sunday the vital importance of being part of a discipleship group, a cell group, where you're not sort of decided by one leader only, but you have one another to speak into one another's lives, to help one another. And this is the great goal of the Holy Spirit in all of our lives, that Christ might be formed in us. Not just that we confess Christ, which is vital to do, but that we experience Him and that Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, is shaped and formed in our lives. And for that, we need one another. Amen and amen. Amen. Because the Spirit of Christ in you connects with the Spirit of Christ in your brother, and together you can provoke one another to love and good deeds. I want you to provoke one another. Not the way I saw two people provoking one another in the car park on the way in. That's another kind of thing. God bless you, love each other, forgive each other, and you'll be happy forever. Or how I felt provoked when somebody scratched my car. Uh, the other, uh, uh, thank you, Jesus. Let's go. Let's, let's, stay, let's go with the flow. I am being shaped by the Spirit of God, not by influences upon me. Thank you, Jesus. Now, it's hard to explain this because the way I've said it so far kind of makes it sound as if the Holy Spirit is active and he's doing this anyway, and I guess he is. But we do have to yield our lives to the Spirit of God. You can resist the Spirit of God in holiness. He's resistible in that. You can say no to God. I mean, you'll regret it, but you can say no because he won't interfere. He wants your your, your willingness here. 
However, remember that even your willingness to yield to God is no cause to boast. It's God's grace that shapes your life. Don't try and do this through artificial external means, such as, uh, as the wrong kind of application of the Word of God through legalistic means or false standards. Let this happen from within as you're changed from within. But at the very, very least, you have to open your heart to the Holy Spirit and say, search me, show me. I want to see what is going on here, and I want to yield to you when you put your finger on it. Amen and amen, amen. through the Word and the Spirit. Moving on. Not only does he shape your life and form you to be like Jesus, he gives you purpose and meaning, and in that context, true fulfillment. Can I take a little aside here? I'll go over there to show you I'm doing an aside. I think we are very wrong to believe that Jesus' first commitment is to your on our happiness here on earth. Let that sink in. That's, that's the world's way of thinking. It's all about being happy. It's all about feeling good. Well, if you have only a happy, feel-good factor in the Christian life, you'll get nowhere because sometimes God has to make you sad before he changes you. Sometimes it's the sad experiences that drive us closer to him. So I don't believe that God, in in the first instance, is committed to our temporal happiness. And that sounds like he's a monster. Of course, he's not. But there are times when we'll be tested and tried. He says, take up your cross. That sounds pretty painful to me. Yes, beyond the cross is resurrection. Hallelujah for that. But you know, God's commitment is that ultimately we will know what true fulfillment is, true fullness is, and it isn't found in the self-help books in the bookshop. Not ours, but the secular bookshops. (laughs) It's not found anywhere. It's only found in the Spirit of God. And the fact is, if, if my whatever number of years, anything to go by, I dare not ask RT, as so many more years of experience more than me in living on this planet, his great and wonderful ripe age. But, as I feel a young man in front of him, which is I'm playing this point to the fullest, <laughs> if anything I've learned is that, that the real fulfillment, the real life of blessing and joy and glory is yet to come. On the earth, we have struggles. We'll always be battling against the flesh. We'll always have those struggles. We will never live in the complete fullness of the gospel until the whole creation has been turned right round and we are enjoying our reward with Jesus in heaven. So in the meantime, we've got to be prepared to, to suck up some stuff. It's not all about feeling good, but thank God there's enough feel good to keep us happy and believing in the future. Amen and amen. That's for the happy, happy Christians here. Amen. (laughs) True purpose and meaning, even if it's a partial foretaste of the future, but we know it's coming. And then finally, the work of the Spirit is to bring us into the light and understanding of His revelation. This begins, of course... By acknowledging that the scripture is spirit-filled to the extreme. Every verse of the Bible is charged with the Spirit of God, oozing with the oil of God, ready for you to grip and experience God. The point of contact. Heaven touches the earth in the Word. And then beyond that, not beyond the Word, but beyond the fact of the revelation is the experience of God as the Holy Spirit takes the scripture and makes it real to us and reveals Christ to us and shows us the glory of God and as God speaks to us through the scripture the word just seems to grow and grow and grow and gives us guidance and direction for every day of our lives and even beyond that the spirit of God who is the living presence of God in our hearts gives us direct witness, direct manifestation, and at times a direct word from God, which is totally consistent with his written revelation, but is applied to our lives so personally, so intimately, that we say, thank you, God, I know that you've searched my heart and you know me in the depth of my being. So out of that very simple verse, Paul takes it in this context as well, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Could the musicians and singers come back on the platform, please? For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God 
in the face of Jesus Christ. This to me, and I can't prove it, but it fits. This to me is Paul commenting on the very verses that I've been speaking about. Paul wants you to know this, that God who brought light into the darkness of that original phase of the creation is the God who has shone in our hearts uh, from outside. We didn't come to our own enlightenment. Remember what God said, what Jesus said to Peter, Peter, you're blessed. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven, have you had the revelation that Jesus is the Christ? And I believe in debating, but all the debates in the world, all the persuasion, all of the facts of science, philosophy, and art will not bring a soul to Christ without God revealing who Jesus is. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Have you received him today as who he is? The God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. That's what it's all about. It's not the light of a knowledge of a full and satisfied life. The light of a knowledge of how to have a happy marriage. The light of knowledge of how to have a healthy life. How to be healthy, wealthy, wise, and all the rest of it. Some of those things are byproducts of the gospel in various ways, but at the heart of it is God's commitment to his own glory, and that's where it begins, and that's where it ends, and the sooner we get onto that program, the better. It's all about God and the glory of God. And then it says, in the face, the person of Jesus Christ. To know that all God's purposes, all God's plans, everything about shaping our lives, filling our lives, and bringing us revelation, is that the Spirit of God would spotlight the face of Jesus, that we would see him, and worship him, and know him. 